This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Once upon a time, Africa's history told of the rise and fall of kings and kingdoms, of great battles and brave warriors, of great triumphs and ancient traditions. These records, so proudly passed down from generation to generation, were fragile by nature and fell victim to European expansion. Today, these records have all but disappeared. Yet many clues to Africa's history remain buried under the ground or are still alive in the surviving cultures and traditions of Africa. These clues bear testimony to civilized and innovative societies in Africa long before Europeans set sail to explore the world. This story is a quest to uncover a great era in South Africa's history, one that is a thousand years old, but is known only to very few. A thousand years ago in Southern Africa, at the confluence of the Shashi and Limpopo rivers, flourished a great African kingdom. Its power extended far beyond the natural boundaries of these rivers, and its people occupied the hundreds of sandstone hills that rise from this ancient floodplain. Tucked away in this valley, on a well-concealed hill, lie the ruins of Southern Africa's very first city, Mapungubwe. Mapungubwe may well not be the name its inhabitants used a thousand years ago. In Sisutu, Mapungubwe means place of the jackal, and in Chivenda, it means place of stone. Today, the remains of this ancient city lie on the farm Griefswald, named by the first white settlers who came to the area before the turn of the century. In 1933, a group of desperate farmers discovered the riches that had been buried there almost a thousand years before. Since then, Mapunguwe Hill has been dug, studied, dated, tested, and retested. By the end of the 20th century, Mapungubwe had come to share the farm with the South African Defence Force. Today, this building houses South Africa's most valuable cultural artefacts, collected at Mapungubwe. These artefacts, unknown to the public, have been stored here for more than 60 years. At Mapungubwe, 800 years ago, the people buried their last king. His body lay in a hut for nine months, while a new leader was elected. Here, for the first time in the history of Southern Africa, a king or sacred leader ruled over his subjects and in turn was venerated by them. For centuries after, these royal graves rested peacefully on top of the hill. I just believe the... The old people are moving around. The, their graves were up here. And um, uh, so why shouldn't their spirits move around? It's not common in the archaeological world that you can actually pinpoint and say, this is the place where society transformed from one quite different kind of uh, organization to another. And that's one of the things that makes this place absolutely unique. In this area, gold was first worked. Many years before you had gold mined in Johannesburg, long before the whites came to South Africa, blacks had been involved in mining. Mapungubwe is just one small monument, but a very important one in this uh, cycle of questions on the heritage and ancestry and history of humanity, Homo sapiens. At Mapungubwe, people carried over 10,000 tons of sand up difficult paths to level the hilltop for the king's residence. These are called spindle whirls. These are clay discs with a hole. Now what they would have done is to put them onto a stick, would have gone onto the end of it, and then there would have been a hook or something anyway that goes into the bowl of cotton. And by twirling this, it can be done by rolling it on your thigh like that or you can do it like that with the weight on it, and that spinning motion helps pull the cotton out. That's why it's called a spindle whirl. 
It's the first site, the oldest site in the country that has produced these things. And so presumably the Limpopo Valley is the first place where cotton was actually cultivated within Southern Africa. If you love history, then you'll love History Hit. We have tons of exclusive documentaries about the most important people in history that you will not find anywhere else. Whether you're looking for insight into the reign of medieval history's most notorious rulers, or to experience the mysteries of cultures and civilizations long lost, History Hit has the documentary for you at just a click away. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you can't find anywhere else. Sign up now for a 14-day free trial, and Chronicle fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code CHRONICLE at checkout. By about 200 AD, people began migrating south from the Great Lakes region. Some settled in the Limpopo Valley. The proximity to the river and its floodplains, the rainfall patterns and the soil conditions all provided a favorable environment for raising cattle and harvesting crops to sustain an expanding community. Towards the end of the first millennium, changes occurred that were ultimately responsible for the emergence of a new society at Shroda and for the eventual rise of Mapungubwe. Islamic seafarers were attracted by trade opportunities along East Africa's coast since before the birth of Christ. They had expanded their trade southward as far as Sofala on the Mozambique coast by 900 AD. Dows laden with beads, cloth and glazed pottery would leave Arabian, Persian and Indian ports during their winter months, catching the monsoon winds which swept them southwest towards the African coast. Once goods had been bartered and exchanged, the dows, now laden with gold, ivory and animal skins, could make their return trip when the monsoon winds changed direction. This trade on the east coast was the main ingredient that contributed to the rise of Mapungubwe in the 1200s. Anywhere from 3,000 to 5,000 people lived here. This guy controlled an area of roughly the same size as the Zulu Kingdom. That would have been about 30,000 square kilometers. This is the largest known settlement anywhere in Southern Africa at the time. And for the very first time, a chief lived up on top of the hill and the ordinary guys lived down below. By the 10th century, the Arab Swahili traders had exhausted the natural resources available in the vicinity of Sofala and were forced to look to the interior for new trade opportunities. Here at Schroeder, it began as a smaller site and with the trade became larger and larger and spread out from close to the side of the hill here out towards the river, covering at its maximum about 15 hectares and an estimated 500 to 700 people were living here, which made it, for that time, the largest village here in southern Africa that we know of. Here, at the first cattle-based settlement in the valley, began the process of this society's transformation that would culminate at Mapungubwe. Shroda, named after the farm on which it stands, is situated a few kilometers northeast of Mapungubwe, and like Mapungubwe, overlooks the Limpopo River. Today, many people still measure wealth and status in terms of ownership of cattle. And, as is tradition, bride price or lobola is fixed on cattle. For centuries past, celebrations, rituals and trade took place in the cattle kraal. The cattle kraal was the center of the community and the burial place for high-ranking members of society. But then, at Schroda, beads were introduced, adding a new currency with which to barter and trade. These beads came in as a result of the local people starting to trade artifacts and other goods with the people that were coming in from the East Coast, the Arab Islamic trader. Schroda became a significant source of ivory for the Swahili merchants who had to satisfy the great demand for it in India and China. Today, Schroeder's status is verified by the fact that more glass beads have been found there than at all the other Iron Age sites in southern Africa put together. The next phase in the evolution of the Mapungubwe culture began at a site called K2, 
in about the year 1000 AD, when a new group of people, attracted by trade and other opportunities, moved in and conquered the area. They sent the people of Schroda fleeing to the west, blocking them off from the east coast trade. The new conquerors settled at K2, just one kilometer southwest of Mapungulwe. Boom, they cut off the trade to all these other people. They start manufacturing their own glass beads. There's a little thing called a garden roller. It's made up of something like 30 other little beads. They've been crushed, melted into a mold, and made into a bigger thing. Now, those things were made at K2. The molds are there, the, the blanks are there, so to speak. There's no doubt that they made them. Now, maybe they were worried about the value of the beads, that so many beads were coming in, they wanted to make sure that it maintained their value. They were able to store up wealth themselves. And it's that generation of wealth like that that gave the impetus to the development of class distinction. Because you see, what you want to do is not let everybody have it. It's the, it's the unequal distribution, right? It's the royals who want to keep this stuff. And so they make their bride price so high that only other royals can afford it. No commoners can afford it. And so they're keeping the wealth all locked up into the upper, upper class. At K2, a more powerful ruling class emerged. Trade activities increased dramatically, and gold began to play a more important role in the economy, attracting more people to the area. With this new source of prosperity, cattle were no longer the determining factor for wealth and were physically and symbolically moved to the periphery of society. The cattle kraals were to make way for the new law and trade courts. But with the commoners and the new elite living side by side, the situation in this small valley became less than ideal. Society's intrinsic pattern had evolved, requiring a complete separation between the leader and his subjects. So the royal elite at K2 made a conscious decision to move to Mapungulwe Hill, which was better suited to their needs. separated from his people. And he was that way because of a special relationship he was supposed to have to his ancestors and that his ancestors had to God. I'm standing here on the edge of the commoner's court. Now this is where ordinary people would come to resolve disputes. Now this court was owned by the king, might have even been called his, his court, but he didn't run it because he's aloof, remember, he lives up on the hill, secluded from everybody. He has a brother, and that brother was probably living over here. There's some prestige stone walling, a um, couple of hut platforms, some terraces and stuff. This almost certainly is where that guy should live. On the basis of the way Vinda and Shona used to do it, royals should surround the hill. They perform a protective circle around the leader. <clears throat> That's what we're seeing here. So we got royals on the slopes of the hill, royals on that, and then the commoners out here in between. Even in Vinda and Shona today, they use a phrase expressing this whole thing. To climb the mountain, you must go zigzag. He is seen as the mountain. To climb the mountain is a phrase for to approach the chief, and then zigzag means you go to somebody else first, because you can never approach one of these important guys directly. Here behind me is this passage that you would have to take to get to the chief. I mean, this is really a struggle. You can't treat him like a rock star. You can only get to him in ones and twos. It's really a difficult thing. Here on the hill, the king was isolated and protected and lived with his wives, his guards, his advisors, and his healers. Daily, many people would climb this difficult path to bring supplies and provisions to the king's residence or to pay tribute. The hilltop some 300 meters long and 50 meters wide in places, was laid out symbolically, with each person having their rightful place. If we use an East African parallel, there's a special praiser, 
And as the king would walk, they'll go, he's moving left, he's moving left, he's moving right, he's moving right. He sneezes. oh God, he sneezes. he sneezes. And according even to the Portuguese documents, the king sneezes on the hill. Within a few minutes, everybody throughout the town knows the king has sneezed. Uh, <clears throat> this is a great ritualization of leadership that you just don't find among other peoples. <laughs> During the years of Mapungulwe, the demand for gold grew. The king became wealthier than anyone before him. But by the time we get to Mapungubwe, because we have gold beads that are here, we've got the gold rhino and stuff like that, then it's obviously changed and it's taken on an internal value and it's become wealth, not just a means to wealth, not a way of getting glass beads, but it is wealth itself. For the miners at Mapungubwe, extracting the gold was very hard work. Only one person at a time could descend through the narrow shafts. Once underground, the miners would follow the seam of gold and would use iron pikes to break out the gold-bearing rock, which was then lifted to the surface in baskets. The people of Mapungulwe were already highly skilled in the smelting of hard metals like iron, so the smelting of gold was easier. This area here has been excavated. You can see bare rock and you can see a big hole over there. This was the royal cemetery. Now we know it was royal because first of all, it's up on this hilltop. And secondly, we know it's royal because there were gold burials here. There were something like 23 burials in all, and three of them had gold. They had gold beads, gold bangles, and these famous gold objects, the golden rhino, a bowl. These are all made out of gold sheeting tacked onto wooden cores. And then there's what's called the scepter. One of them, in the sitting position, had the scepter, something like across its, his arms. This was the man. The bowl was behind him, and there was at least one golden rhino. Now, the golden rhino also is quite important in this. This rhino was almost certainly a black rhino, not a white rhino. In the Shona world, uh, a black rhino is seen as something really quite special. It has two names, one that sort of just means black, but the other one is a word like pimbera, pimbela. Now, that's the name for a dance that chiefs are supposed to do on the graves of their ancestors at least once a year. It's a sort of mock fight. They jump up in the air, they've got a spear in one hand and a shield in the other. They're stabbing and feigning off imaginary blows. The rhinoceros was constructed out of several pieces of fine gold foil, which were attached to an inner wooden core using pure gold nails. The rhinoceros symbolizes stubbornness and power and must have been made in honor of a great king. At Mapungulwe, the crafting of gold and other objects became the trademark of a remarkable civilization. Once, all paths in the region led to this great capital. Leaders stationed at distant outposts controlled entry to this land and administered the law. In this valley, over a period of 400 years, from the start of Shroda to the decline of Mapungulwe, evolved the first highly organized and civilized society in southern Africa. Yet this great kingdom came to an abrupt end at the turn of the 13th century. The capital is deserted, and the hilltop itself would never be occupied again. The past 500 years have seen waves of colonizers invading Africa's shores to claim their piece of her natural wealth, and in the process, destroy the fragile yet valuable records of her past. But the royal skeletons at Mapungulwe rested peacefully on the hill protected by the fact that ancestral graves were sacrosanct and not to be disturbed. Suddenly he noticed that the disturbance of rock had taken place. In South Africa, another 600 years would pass before the next city of gold was born, Johannesburg. He realized that this vast upheaval of nature was worth investigating. Continuous rumors of gold motivated European prospectors in the late 1800s to set out for the so-called savage interior of South Africa to find the source of the gold that Africans had been mining for centuries. The discovery of gold on the Witwatersrand in 1886 would propel Southern Africa into an era of rapid change. In this period of industrialization and political upheaval, the rights of the black man were completely and systematically wiped out.
While Johannesburg, this modern city of gold, began to flourish, the remnants of another place of gold were being discovered. One day, while out walking, a man stumbled on a pot of gold, a treasure, or so this legend goes. According to this legend, this man, Lotiri, upon arriving in the Limpopo Valley, was so struck by its beauty that he left the great trek of which he had been part to live a solitary life as a hermit near Mapungube Hill. Rumors circulated that he found a pot and some exposed gold, which he later buried in a secret place. Another version told that he gave a pot to a local man. People all over the northern Transvaal were telling about the gold hill, hill of gold, and pots of gold that had been discovered here, and they related it to, uh, to King Solomon, and uh, uh, the Queen of Sheba also came in somewhere. For decades, the rumor of a hill of gold persisted. And when a severe drought and depression hit the region, white settlers, mostly Afrikaner farmers, had their hopes of survival fueled by this legend. One day in 1932, out of desperation, the Van Hrans and Van der Walt went to see Muena. They believed he knew where the fortunes were buried. For locals, the hill was a place of fear and they believed that to climb it meant certain death. Muena refused to help them, saying that if they went up, they would never return alive. But they managed to persuade Muena's younger brother to show them the way. Muena, with his back to the hill and his eyes averted, pointed out the route up Mapungubwe Hill. Muena showed us the hill and the secret path, but refused to accompany us. We looked around a bit on the hill, but found only broken pots lying around and very little else. Then my father told us to get down on our hands and knees. At first we only found the odd iron tool, then some pieces of copper. Suddenly I found a pretty piece of gold. The Van Kranz had discovered the first royal burial site and the first wrought iron objects in South Africa. They recovered about 75 ounces of gold which they decided to divide amongst themselves and say nothing. The young Van Hran, who had been a student at the University of Pretoria, was plagued by his conscience and sent a letter with a selection of the found metals to his professor, Leo Fouchier. The lab results are incredible. Gold plate, 93,82% pure gold, and the bangles, 91,23%. My goodness, yes, yes, similar to the Zimbabwe ruins indeed, certainly of great significance. Professor van Riet Lowe of the University of the Witwatersrand immediately gave the site a preliminary inspection. He reported that it was a site of major importance, one which was practically undisturbed and still intact. Dear Mr. van Gran, the Union government promptly acquired the farm Greifswald and entrusted the investigations, which they declared a national priority, to the University of Pretoria. I have no doubt that the government will... Jan Smuts had the treasures recovered and, with Professor Fouchier in charge, work at Mapungubwe began. The first team spent two seasons at Mapungubwe. Due to the remoteness and extreme temperatures in the valley, they could only dig in the winter months of the year. This is an amazing, diverse collection. P.W. van Donner, an excavator and not an archaeologist, volunteered to stay on through the summer months to work alone on the hilltop. Here he found the first fully authentic and preserved royal burial ground. The dating and ethnic origins of these graves would be disputed for decades to come. Golden scepter and rhinoceros. Ah, oh, what a treasure for the historian and for the University of Pretoria. In 1936, the archaeology committee put the golden rhinoceros on display at the Transvaal Museum. In 1937, the results of work on the site were published in an elaborate report entitled Mapungubwe, Ancient Bantu Civilizations on the Limpopo. The report concluded that the pottery showed clear links to Shona and Sudutswana cultures and that the site was obviously of African origin. Professor Fushir believed that Mapungubwe was less than 200 years old and that it came after Great Zimbabwe. Both these theories would later be dispelled. Fushir concluded that a dozen experts should be set to the task that lay ahead. There were still many questions that remained unanswered. Here's his invitation to other universities to collaborate with the University of Pretoria to continue 
the exploration of Mapungubwe. But uh, of course it never happened. No sooner was the golden rhinoceros put on public display than it was promptly taken off. It was locked in a vault at the University of Pretoria, only to see the light of day on rare occasions. This important piece of history was interred in a grave of silence. Thereafter, silence also descended on the question of Mapungubwe, site of black achievement in a land ruled by whites. Pretoria University appointed only one man, Captain Guy Gardner, to this massive task. He excavated from 1935 to 1940, but the report on his findings was only published in 1963, 23 valuable years later. Gardner had an Egyptian background, and when he, when he was appointed there, um, uh, that was in the late 30s, as far as I can remember, um, he had certain preconceived ideas. He, he also found certain things which suggested to him well, this wasn't purely African. And so that got him onto this uh, theory of his. Fouché's book, the very first one, was called Ancient Bantu Civilizations on the Limpopo. And Gardner said, oh, it's neither ancient, it's neither Bantu, and it's not civilized. It's hot and tot instead. The few Negro features seen at Mapungubwe could have been caused by a single intrepid Negro who had entered as an alien into a foreign territory. The first Negro migration could not have reached as far south as Mapungubwe by the time of its original settlement. Gardner's interpretation of this as a hot and tot settlement is part of the overall race debate. Were there black people in the country before white people and so on? His data was used by people later to demonstrate that black people didn't get here any sooner than uh, people at the Cape. In fact, they would have been crossing the Limpopo when Van Riebeck was landing in the Cape, that kind of stuff. Gardiner believed that the first settlers at K2 were not Bantu-speaking people, nor did they have the skills associated with the Iron Age, and so created the term proto hottentot and bush boscopoid to describe them. The boscop thing was something that was invented kind of invented in those earlier days, so there, there's really no such thing. But we do all know of, of the Khoisan, Khoisan or Bushman, so-called Bushman people, Khoisan people. It is perhaps now permissible to imagine the outward appearance of our K2 folk. Their heads were large, their massive jaws and great teeth denoted flesh-eating individuals. Many of their women must have presented that peculiar characteristic of the bush race, namely the fatty accumulation on the buttocks, amounting to real deformity in our eyes. Gardner collected most of the 108 skeletons from K2 and Mapungubwe that today are part of the collection at Pretoria University's anatomy department. His theory that this site was not of African origin contradicted that of Fouché. This debate would continue for many years. Now it's, we all know that it was African black people living there. If we get a skeleton and we have no context for it, it means nothing. So we want to know what the context were, how was it buried, what, in what area of the site, and so on. So all that information is very important for us. Excavation, they say, is destruction. If you mess up with your excavation, you can't go and put it back. This was a gold site. This is a site containing graves with gold. Everybody else is interested in, in the gold aspect and just about nothing else. Professor Hannes Irloff recalls a visit to Mapungubwe as a young boy at the time of Captain Gardner's excavations. I can clearly remember people moving out of this excavated area with wheelbarrows and uh, just um, throwing the, uh, the material away without sieving. He would only uh, sift every now and again. He was told to sift every three um, wheelbarrow loads of uh, soil. A wheelbarrow in itself is already mixing everything up. Gardner worked with Van Toner, who had been part of Professor Fouchier's team. Van Toner would design and build a machine that would help speed up the excavations, and for several seasons, he and a crew of black laborers worked alone on the hilltop. <laughs> The 
fact is there that Gardner's work, unfortunately, did a lot of damage. At Mopangubi and at K2, he literally shoveled away the archaeological deposit and tipped a lot of it over the side of Mopangubi or the sides of K2 in order just to get rid of it. At the time of Gardner's excavations, many people looked to Egypt to explain their findings in southern Africa. In their eyes, a place like Egypt represented a true civilization. Years before the birth of Christ, Solomon, king of Israel, built this wonderful temple. Solomon always had an eye for a good-looking woman. And when the queen of Sheba came to visit him, he summoned his emissaries and ordered them, go thou to Ophir and bring back gold and precious stones. And they went forth on their way to King Solomon's mines. At a public meeting held in South Africa in 1929, the respected archeologist Gertrude Caton Thompson argued convincingly that all the evidence at Great Zimbabwe showed that it had been built and occupied by the ancestors of the Shona people. The famous paleontologist Raymond Dart also attended the meeting. When uh, Kate and Thompson showed that if there was nothing Egyptian in it at all, it was all just uh, <coughs> basically African in origin, uh, Dart broke down at the meeting which was organized in, in nine, to, to announce this here in Joburg. He actually broke down and had to be taken out. Amidst his sobs, he said that Kate and Thompson's announcement ruined archaeology forever, it had taken the Egyptian remains away. The general opinion to a very large degree was uh, that Africa had never had the opportunity to, de to develop or evolve into that type of high level of sophistication that was needed to melt gold, to be able to build walls and so on. People who came from Europe were unable to believe that Africans could do that. Every stone is cut in accordance with the ancient architect's plans. If natives did design and construct these walls, then they have lost the art. For it seems inconceivable that the majority of them should live today in crude huts such as these. The Great Trek was immortalized in the construction of the Fuhr Trekker monument which honored the Afrikaner's claim to the land and became the symbolic site for pilgrimage and ritual of the Afrikaner. In this wave of Afrikaner patriotism, Africans' voices were denied and testaments to their heritage were buried. Ironically, Murtek, the architect of this monument that celebrates the Afrikaner's achievements, also owned a farm adjoining Kreswald. He based his design for the monument on a hill near Mapungue, a site of African achievement. It was only in 1969 that the Pretoria University established a department of archaeology. Hannes Irloff became its head. Well, I can say without any doubt that if it hadn't been for Mapungue, there wouldn't have been a department of archaeology at Pretoria University. And, uh, uh, I wouldn't have become the head of that department. Over the next 25 years, Pretoria's archaeology department organized regular student trips for practical training at Mapungubwe. Students are talking and laughing and they're excited. Then we move up here and sit next to what I refer to as the Queen's Grave. And I tell them the story of this very important person who was buried there with lots of gold beads on her. And uh, she was a very important person. And it's less than a thousand years. And today, we don't know anything about her. We don't know what her name was. We don't know how she looked or anything. So we, ordinary people, we are nothing. Until now, look up at the stars and just realize how terribly insignificant we are. Now try and philosophize, you know, and then when we move back, they whisper, 
They don't laugh anymore. I just want to create that atmosphere. Once I could imagine a tall warrior looking over my shoulder into the past and agreeing with me that it must have been, it is a nice sight. I had that feeling and I still remember it after 20 years. So I'm convinced that there must be nice spirits there who would like us to uh, protect their heritage and value it. It had become necessary for the apartheid government to defend itself against the rising tide of African nationalism and the Afrikaner nationalists' other great foe, communism. In 1968, while the excavation rights still vested with the University of Pretoria, Chriswald was appropriated by the military. And for the next 25 years, the farm was controlled by the army. Today, although only parts of it still stand, it is a symbol of the futile attempt of the white minority to cling to power against all odds. Pick Buerta, South Africa's longest serving foreign minister, visited Mapungubwe on many occasions. Mr. P.W. Buerta had the habit of, of, of taking the cabinet into retreat positions, you know, like uh, Boschbrad. And this was an ideal place for a Boschbrad. We would uh, receive instruction and briefings from a host of security people. The psychiatric services of the South African Defense Force also based themselves at Gresswald. Dr. Aubrey Levine, a graduate of Pretoria University, headed the rehabilitation program. His methods often involved the shock treatment of gays and drug abusers. Many of the buildings in this remote setting were erected by their labor. Permission to visit the archaeological site on Kreefsfeld had to be granted by the South African Defense Force. For many years, it became impossible for outsiders to visit Mapungubwe. It was said that this place was not opened to the public. So I made no effort of coming to, to, to come here, because in any case, in the past, certain places were meant for the uh, blankets, that is, white people. Throughout the 70s, the 80s, and into the 90s, Pretoria University continued their excavations at Mapungubwe. And from all accounts of staff and students, the department had an excellent relationship with the army. This hut, standing in the shadow of the hill, became another storage facility for the mass of artifacts excavated through the decades. Many of the ceramic, bone, and metal artifacts stored here were excavated in the 1930s. Animal droppings litter the place. The roof has been stolen, the boxes and labels are damaged from the damp. All evidence of years of neglect. I first heard of uh, Mapungubia not long ago. I mean, I did history at school. We didn't take Venda history. But rather, we took those uh, topics that had uh, some relevance to white historians but very little African history was taught to us. African history was primitive. It was not worth studying. We only started that only when it affected white interest. I, I look back at that brochure on Mapungupe from the Pretoria University, but if you, if you look carefully, you'll see the references to the ideology of those days. Uh, Almost every second page, it is stressed that there is no relationship between the contemporary African cultures and the ones living at Mapungupe. The state's ideology conveniently created some black hole in the history of South Africa between the arrival and settlement of the contemporary African-speaking people and the uh, archaeological leftovers of the previous people. Just as a matter of interest, I took this South African yearbook. But then if you start reading in between the lines, you realize that it fits in beautifully with the, the spirit of the day. You look, for instance, at the section on the national monuments, then all of a sudden it becomes clear why Pretoria University acted the way they were acting. There's a whole list of uh, national monuments, and there's exactly three I'm not mistaken, that referred to the African past. If the politicians who made the laws could have in, uh, just adapted it to the extent that the history could have been 
included earlier, then we wouldn't have had this, this problem we're talking about of uh, denying heritage to people. It was unfortunate, uh, perhaps not so much in terms of uh, archaeology in general, but there were archaeologists who were told to toe the line. They were working at a government institution and had to be very, very careful about what they said. And I was not really very involved with those politics. I was, I was digging away into the past, and that was all I thought about for many years uh, until I met my wife. And so on. The problem with Map and Google is what all the chances they've missed, everything they have not done with it. And then the picture of innocence is slowly fading away. Then all of a sudden you feel, you sense, although you can't pinpoint it directly, the ideological evil behind it. You know, we don't understand in this country how valuable this is. You see, there's money for a lot of things in this country. But this is one of the most precious historical sites in South Africa. That's what. And look at this. This is where they melted gold and iron. So the people who lived here must already have developed a very high technology. Maybe Queen Sheba got some of her riches from here. Who knows? Zimbabwe, the ruins are not far from here. By the end of the 13th century, the majority of the population of Mapungube began to disperse. Some moved east to join a people that would eventually constitute the Venda nation. Others moved north. Great Zimbabwe, which began in about 1275, adopted and refined most of Mapungube's social, political, and economic patterns, only on a larger scale. But by 1450, this great kingdom had also fallen. The dispersal of people after the reign of Zimbabwe would reverberate across the subcontinent and gave rise to other great states, like the Mwanamutapa in the north and Kami to the east, and Makahane and Tulamela to the south. The first Portuguese caravels rounded the tip of Africa in 1498. At Sofala, the Portuguese heard of the vast riches of a kingdom in the interior, but no one would divulge the route or the location of the gold mines. The Portuguese implemented a divide and rule policy and destroyed the age-old system of trade between the interior of Africa and the east. The colonial era had begun. White settlers carved up and laid claim to land inhabited by indigenous people, but only discovered the great mineral wealth of the interior in the late 19th century. The greatest impact of colonialism was Christianity. The missionaries set about the task of converting Africans, uncivilized heathens in their eyes. The missionaries held a deep conviction of the righteousness of their task and almost succeeded in erasing all remnants of the people's culture and history. Yet despite these incursions, fragments of the past survived into the present. The structures of Mapungubwe were handed down through the generations and traces can be found in different parts of Venda today. One such place is Makumbane of the Chivase clan where vestiges of sacred leadership still exist.
Today, the Makahane clan of the Bavenda people who live in the northeast of South Africa celebrate their ties to the past and pay homage to their ancestry. Tulamela, situated in the Kruger National Park, dates back to 1550 and was occupied by ancestors of the Makahane people who had moved there following the downfall of Great Zimbabwe in 1450 AD. But in the early 1900s, they were forced off the land by white colonialists and missionaries, and it was only in the 1980s that the site was rediscovered. Today, there is a new approach to archaeology, one which is more inclusive and allows other interested and affected communities to participate in the retelling of African history. At Tulamela, using oral research, the Makahanes were recognized as descendants of the site and appointed to officiate at the reburial of their ancestors. The skeletons of Mapungubwe remain nameless. The graves, the bones, the artifacts are the only physical reminders of this past civilization. Will we ever know how and why this kingdom ended? Some suggest that the natural resources of ivory and gold were depleted. Perhaps the kingdom fell in battle against another people. Or did the Arab traders find more lucrative trading partners further north at Great Zimbabwe, cutting off the trade to Mapungubwe? And the weight of the evidence is that it was climatic. The Little Ice Age has spread from Europe and its biggest impact starts around 1300 AD and it made things cold and dry. And that would have then meant it was impossible to grow anything here. Now maybe for a few years they're bringing stuff in as tribute from better areas. But after a while they just can't do that. They can't maintain it and they have to leave. And some of the people go, well they're obviously going to go where there's water, where it's raining. As time has passed, invaluable information about Mapungubwe has disappeared. Had the first archaeologists done proper oral research, perhaps we would know more about the people of Mapungubwe. But with a Western culture obsessed with the written word, oral histories of Africa's past have been too easily dismissed. From all the hmm, published works, there is no evidence that uh, historians anthropologists went to local people to find the history of that particular place. And there is, obviously, amongst the vendor speakers and the Sutu speakers, uh, there is data which is uh, relevant to that kind of exploration. This curious photograph appears near the front of Professor Fouché's report of 1936. It is of a petty chief named Chiwana. During the first season of excavations, Professor Lestrade, an ethnographer, investigated the ethnic origin of people in the region. He interrogated Chiwana. Chiwana claimed that he was a descendant of the last chief of Mapungubwe. The oral history that Chiwane provided told of a woman, Mahobe, the daughter of the last chief at Mapungubwe, who had married a Sutu speaking man. They had settled on the southwest slope of the hill. The following season, the team dug a test pit at the site, and sure enough, they found evidence of Sutu occupation substantiating Chiwana's claim. But Chiwana, as a source of historical information, was never mentioned or heard of again. But it's very, very sad that even archaeologists who, who you know, established that those ruins were built by the bantu speaking people did not try to move around and do a thorough research. In fact, I think perhaps that could be done by less uh, historians. Historians were simply mute. South Africans have had little opportunity to claim, celebrate or share in this history. In 1984, Mapungubwe Hill was recognized as a national monument. And in 1998, more than 60 years after the initial discovery, some of the golden artifacts, including the rhinoceros, scepter and bowl, were declared national treasures. The massive task of identifying and cataloguing the artifacts from the university storeroom at Mapungubwe has begun. For now, 
The treasures remain in the custody of the university, stored on the 17th floor of this inaccessible building. Perhaps one day soon, they will be displayed for all to see and appreciate. This seemingly desolate valley still holds some of the most important clues to Southern Africa's past. Through the decades, academics have explored, excavated, studied and dissected Mapungubwe, but still some of the answers elude them. The burden to explain and search for the answers falls on a small community of archaeologists. In spite of all that has happened, Mapungubwe's legacy will live on. In Southern Africa, many kingdoms have come and gone. Mapungubwe knew days of splendor, abandonment, and rediscovery. It was a place of kings, of the golden rhinoceros, and a place of stone.